and welcome back before we get into the episode just want to let you know that this is the free version of the podcast and all that means is that we are way behind where i'm at in patreon so if you are loving this podcast and you need more john constantine in your life definitely go check us out at patreon.com slash planes trains and comic books and sign up for the hellblazer tier where you'll get access to the entire hellblazer library that i've recorded so far and also you get access to the exclusive episodes of the Planes, Trains, and Comic Books main podcast. So if any of that sounds good to you, definitely go over to patreon.com slash planes, trains, and comic books, all one word, and sign up there. And with that out of the way, let's get into the issue. Today we are reading Hellblazer number 27. And just a little catch up from the last issue. Uh, and the last two issues, actually, John was away in some town named Thursdyke. He was there visiting his friend named Una, who had written a letter to him inviting him to come check out this cool pagan festival in this town. So he went, and while he was there, it turns out that there was like some sort of military base uh, nearby, and in that base was some kind of like god of fear and war and all this stuff, and uh, it drove the people crazy in the town, and they did horrible, unspeakable acts to each other. And the local priest who went crazy uh, ended up stealing one of the jets from that airbase and bombing the town. And so that town is pretty much gone. And John got out of there without a scratch, but his friend Una died. And then he went back to London uh, like hitchhiking. So uh, this issue kind of doesn't pick up anywhere near any of those stories. It's kind of a one-off. And uh, this is a new writer and everything too on this one as well. So uh, I believe after this we go back to... Uh, Jamie Delano's run with the Family Man story arc, but uh, for these three issues, we took a break, and this issue is pretty unique and interesting. Um, it's one of my favorites from the entire run of Hellblazer, and uh, it is written by Neil Gaiman, which is always very cool. At this time, he was writing Sandman and making his uh, name in comics and getting bigger and stuff, so this is from March 1990, so it's about two years after he started Sandman. So first things first, we got the cover here. There is a man in the background of this cover. It's very dark, by the way, and uh, kind of esoteric. But there's a man in the background kind of hugging himself. Uh, and then in front of that, we see the Hellblazer logo and then also a heart with John's face in it. And the name of the comic is actually on the cover, and it's called Hold Me. And like I said, this is written by Neil Gaiman, and the art is by Dave McKean. And we start off on the first page with a couple of homeless people, four to be exact, and uh, they're all, I guess they all know each other, and they're all just kind of drinking and hanging out under a bridge. There's a couple, and their names are Fat Ronnie and Sylvia, and then there's a man named Jocko, and he's kind of like one of the main characters of the story, and then there's also a man named Old Bill who brings the alcohol, so they're, they're happy about that. But they mentioned specifically that this is early spring, and unfortunately, it's very cold this spring. Winter, I guess, has stayed longer than normal, and they're trying to find somewhere warm, but like I said, they're homeless, so they're just going around kind of trying to get cover, trying to get warm, and eventually they come upon like a housing complex, so basically just a tall building that is apartments, and in the narration, it says... On the fourth floor, no light, no power, no food. Still, somewhere to be, somewhere to hide until things got warmer. It was so cold, very cold that spring. So when they get to the apartment that they're going to go into, uh, it turns out, I guess, old Bill left. Uh, and so it's just Jocko and the couple. And as the couple kind of huddle together for warmth, uh, Jocko is there and we see the narration saying, Ronnie and Sylvia rip down a curtain and wrap it around themselves. He held each other for warmth. Jocko knew it was too cold even for that, and there was no one to hold Jocko anyway. Ice crystals glittered on the window of glass, and the lights of London burned clear and cold in the darkness. He had to get away. He had to hide. He had to get warm. This was his home, and he'd be buggered if anyone was going to take it away from him. So while the narration is going on, we see uh, Jocko kind of slump over, and his eyes kind of look very blue and so does his body like he's very very cold and then we see like a spider crawl across his face and then we get a couple of zoomed out panels that show him laying next to the couple as they're huddled together and then it says he hid and then we see his body just kind of disappear and vanish from the room and then we cut to john constantine who is hailing a taxi 
And uh, it says that it is now autumn, so six months from the homeless people trying to get warm in that room. So like I said, John is hailing a taxi, and uh, he's trying to go somewhere, but as what usually happens whenever John is getting driven somewhere, because of course he can't drive, uh, the person is either a joy to talk to or they're the worst person in the world. So the guy that's driving him is talking about immigrants and complaining about them and getting kind of racist. So John is like, you know what? Just stop the taxi. I'm good. Here's your money. And the taxi driver is like, what? I don't get a tip. And Constantine's like, sure. Here's your tip. Get a new mind. The one you've got now is narrow and full of crap. So as the taxi driver drives away and starts yelling at Constantine and swearing at him and stuff, John is walking and he gets asked by another homeless person if he can have a cigarette. And John just kind of is interested in the amount of homeless people that he's seeing more often in the city. And also he's talking about where he's going and where he's going is a party for his buddy Ray. And if you remember, his buddy Ray died, uh, I think, in the first couple issues when a bunch of like skinhead neo-Nazi kids beat him up for being gay. So this is like a party in his old flat with all his old friends kind of remembering how awesome Ray was. So Constantine has been invited, so he's going. And when he gets there, a man opens the door and says, John, so glad you could make it. Grab a drink from the lounge, then come over. There's someone I desperately want you to meet. So John is kind of like pulled into the room and introduced to a woman named Anthea. And of course, she's a dear old friend of Ray's, and Ray told her all about this mysterious man named John Constantine, and the way that they draw her kind of makes her look crazy, <laughs> uh, or like that she has something hidden like uh, as far as her intentions or whatnot. So John begins to talk to her, and as he does, we get some narration where he says, maybe I'm getting sour in my old age, but I don't seem to enjoy parties like I used to. Everybody trying desperately to have fun. It didn't used to be so much effort, did it? Then we cut to a different location. We don't really know where, it doesn't say, but it is definitely like a living room of some kind because there's a woman sitting on a couch watching some TV. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, her child yells out, Mommy, there's a smelly man in my bedroom. I'm scared. And at first the mom is kind of disbelieving and just, you know, assuming the kid is like just having nightmares or something. But the mom decides to stand up and see what's going on. And when she does, she sees that there actually is a man standing in the kid's bedroom. And when she looks at him, she is very terrified. And we get a panel of what she is seeing. And the man that she sees is Jocko, the homeless man from the beginning who fell asleep on the floor by himself. And uh, he's saying to her, hold me. And then he proceeds to walk towards the mom as she backs away, kind of very scared. Um, obviously, and he keeps saying, hold me. So he, she's trying to back away, but she doesn't move fast enough, and he is able to actually grab her, and then she yells out, so cold, as he begins to fully embrace her, and then she falls to the floor, and then we cut away to the outside of the premises, and we see that it is the same building that Jocko and those other homeless people were in in the spring. And we also hear the cries of the child saying, mommy, mommy, you're so cold. Then we cut back to Constantine, who is still talking to Anitha, and John's narration is saying, Anitha's nice. I'm not sure I can read her right, though. Something just doesn't ring true. And then we see what they're talking about, and apparently she brought up AIDS tests or something, because he's answering our question that we didn't see her ask, and he's like, yeah, of course I got an AIDS test. Seemed the sensible thing to do. There's lots of weird stuff in my blood, but that's another story, really. But no HIV antibodies, though. <laughs> So once Anitha hears that, she automatically says, I really don't feel well. It's so stuffy in here. Would you walk me home? And John's like, sure. And then we get a big tall panel of the building that she lives in. And it is, in fact, the building that we've been seeing through this whole thing, uh, the apartment building where those homeless people were at the beginning. And so uh, we get some narration from John. And he says, she lives on a tower estate not far away. My breath steams in the night air. Nice lady, this Anthea real nice even so knock it off john constantine you're getting paranoid in your old age anyway i think she likes me so john's getting you know spider sense tingling feelings but uh he's kind of going with it because he's like she seems fine and you know i'm gonna get laid or whatever <laughs> so, so he's going with it so they walk into her building and they're talking the whole time and we find out that she works at some sort of shelter it doesn't seem like it's only for homeless people but it's like a temporary solution 
you know, for homeless people slash people down on their luck or people who just need a place to stay. But they can't stay there for like a really long time. It's not like a permanent address. It's just for them to be able to like either get out of the cold or get off the street for a little bit or just, you know, get on their feet maybe. So they go up to her floor and right away as they get out of the elevator, John's like, ugh. And then she says, sorry about the smell. And when he asks what it is, she tells him, the flats on this side have been empty for almost a year. The council's meant to be doing them up. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Six months ago, the smell started. It got worse and worse. We thought maybe it was a dead cat or a dog. My roommate Sarah phoned the police, and she marked the door for them so they would know where to go. The police broke in and found two dead tramps under a curtain. Must have been there for months. Police had to scrape them up from the carpet to take them out in plastic bags. Lots of plastic bags. So then they get into her apartment, and she says, you know, sit over on the couch, I'll fix you a drink. And John's like, probably not in the mood from the story she just told him now. And so he's like, listen, if you're still feeling dodgy, like, you know, you're still sick or whatever, I'll just be on my way. And she's like, oh, no, 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 no. I feel great now. I feel great. And then the music that she started playing is really weird. Like the lyrics say, saw my baby. She was turning blue. I realized her young life was through. So it's just like not really romantic music or whatever. So as John's sitting in the living room waiting for his drink, he's narrating, why do I feel like I'm being played for a sucker? Because I do. I mean, I like her, but... And then Anthea comes in the room, and John questions her about the flatmate that Anthea said she had named Sarah. And Anthea's like, oh yeah, she's just my flatmate, but she's out for the night. Give us a kid. She says kid specifically. And then John's like, what? <laughs> and then she's like, uh, I said give us a kiss. And then John has like a memory flash of something. He goes, and Thea, Sarah, and Thea, hang on a second. And then he remembers his old buddy Ray telling him about some lesbian friends he has named Anthea and Sarah. So now the jig is up. John confronts her and is like, you're a lesbian. Why, why are you lying to me? Why are you trying to, you know, seduce me or whatever? So she answers, well, you see, me and Sarah talked it over because we felt it was time to have a baby. And I wanted to bear it, but you can't do it on your own, can you? In the old days, it was simple. You just found a nice gay guy and a warm syringe. But these days, well, with everything, we thought probably safest not to. And, well, Ray always used to say such nice things about you, and we thought genetically you'd be perfect, a little blonde daughter. So I asked Jeff to introduce you, and Sarah went away to her mom's for the night. I was going to tell you afterwards, are you angry? And of course, John is angry. <laughs> He's like, am I angry? What is it with you people? Do I have some kind of sign on my back that says walking sperm bank withdrawals welcome? Is that it? First Alec and Abby and now you. Of course I'm angry. I'm also hurt. Also, I don't know. My masculine pride feels like someone's pissed all over it. You could have bloody asked, you know. You could have bloody asked. So just in case you're not following Swamp Thing, this happened actually with Swamp Thing and his wife, Abby, where Swamp Thing possessed Constantine and used his body to impregnate his wife without Constantine's consent. So so that's what he's talking about with Alec and Abby. And uh, so, yeah, he, he's had this happen before. He's not very happy that someone else would try to trick him. Uh, so he goes outside and he's basically just going to leave. But then as he's walking away, he notices the smell seems to be getting worse and then he sees a child crying in the hallway as he's walking by. So he stops and asks the child what's their name. And she says Shona. And then she tells John that it's about her mom. That a smelly man came through the wall and hugged her mom. And now mommy's all cold and she won't talk to me. She's on the floor. So John takes the child's hand and asks her to walk him back to her flat. And see what's wrong with her mommy. So they get to her flat and he opens the door and right away he's like, you wait here because he doesn't want her to see anything. And when he walks in, he sees the mom right away and he's like, she's dead. I can tell from here from what the kitty says, she can't have been dead for more than a few hours, but she's so cold. She feels like she's been hauled out of a freezer. This isn't natural. This is nasty. And then Shona asks John, is my mommy all right, John? Has she gone to see the baby Jesus? And John responds, something like that, love something like that so of course john is not going to leave that child in the flat so he takes shona to anthea's flat and for some reason she's actually angry at john when she answers even though she's the one who tried to trick him into having a baby 
So uh, to kind of get her back for that, he's like, hey, I got a present for you. She's not a blonde, and I don't know how long you can keep her, but her name's Shona, and if I'm not back in a half hour, call the police and an ambulance and send them to flat 510. So John leaves Shona, and then he goes to flat 510 where there's a padlock on the door um, because that's where the smell is coming from, and that's where the dead homeless couple was found. And so he breaks into it and starts looking around and saying, hello, anyone here? But he does notice that it is very, very cold in that room. And then all of a sudden, a ghostly figure appears of the homeless man, Jocko. And he's saying the same thing to John that he said to Shona's mom. He's saying, hold me, as he extends his hands out to John. And John narrates as the man walks towards him, oh, great, dead of the living night, night of the living dead, whatever. What am I doing? Think. And then he looks at the man and he just says, What's your name? Tell me, please. And then the man says, Jocko, so cold. No, nobody cares. Hold me. And then John kind of looks at him like with sad eyes and is like, hold you. You poor dead bastard. All right. And then he reaches out towards the homeless man and embraces him. And as he's hugging him, he says, you're freezing cold and you smell like a rotten abattoir, mate. Must be hell being dead. And the ghost of Jocko says back to him, Not so cold, warm, thank you. And then as they hug each other, eventually Jocko kind of disappears and is no longer in John's arms. And it's kind of funny, there's a panel where it's just John hugging the air, which is kind of funny. And then there's like a weird panel where I guess like the spirit of the ghost is is like released. And that release energy kind of shocks John and... He actually like physically yells out, ah, Christ. And then it seems like maybe that kind of hurt him physically because it seems like he's limping back to Anthea's flat. And then we get some narration as he knocks on the door and tells her what happened. And the narration says, all he wanted was for someone to care about him, someone to hold him, someone to warm him. Nobody would. When we hold each other in darkness, it doesn't make the darkness go away. The bad things are still out there. The nightmares are still walking. When we hold each other, we feel. Not safe, but better. It's all right. I'm here. I love you, we whisper. I'll never leave you, we lie. For just a moment or two, the darkness doesn't seem so bad when we hold each other. And then we see in the last panel, as Anthea is asking John what happened and saying, oh, you smell awful. What's the matter? John just says to her, Anthea, please shut up just hold me and then he embraces her and that is the end of the issue so so in the next issue issue 28 we're picking back up with the family man story arc so if you have any comments questions suggestions you can email me at planes trains and comic books all one word at gmail.com and we will see you on the next one